I want to talk to you about a context that is very, um, perhaps unnatural to some of you. Maybe it doesn't exactly feel natural. And let me start off by introducing you to a very interesting 10-year-old kid named Griffin Sanders. And not that long ago, Griffin was out for a drive with his great-grandmother, who's 74, and his four-year-old brother. And they were out for a drive uh, in the suburbs of Denver. That's where they live. And they were going down the freeway. They were out for an ice cream or for perhaps some kind of shopping on a Saturday afternoon. And as they were going at full speed, 120 kilometers an hour down the road, Griffin's great-grandmother had a heart attack and keeled over. And the car spun out of control, crossing three lanes of traffic, going into oncoming traffic on the freeway. And Griffin grabbed the wheel of the car, you know, just like a normal 10-year-old boy might do, navigated it through oncoming traffic, slowed it down, and gently put it into the side of the road, where he then picked up his grandmother's cell phone and called 911, saving the, his life, his family's lives, and the lives of many other people on the road. And when he was asked by the cops, who shortly thereafter arrived, like, how did you do this? What's going on? He said, Mario Kart. <laughs> Seriously, you watched the interview online. He's like, oh, I thought it was a challenge in Mario Kart. So I just did what I would do in the game, you know? Pass through the cars and drop them off. You guys, I'm sure, were that good of drivers when you were 10, right? I was the same way. What's going on here? Something has really changed. And the thing that's happening, the thing you see in Griffin's behavior there is called fluid intelligence. It is how we reason our way out of new situations. It's using our brain to solve novel challenges, which is obviously very important because, let's face it, we've solved all the easy challenges in life, right? Now we're moving on to pretty hard stuff. Now, fluid intelligence is different from crystallized intelligence, GC. This is the thing we test. This is the thing when I did my undergrad in human intelligence at Waterloo oh so many years ago. You can do your math, figure this out. We thought that this never changed. I was taught that intelligence never changed, it never evolved. Crystallized intelligence was the thing we think about on IQ tests and stuff. It's really different. And against this context, generations of these Griffins and now their parents, perhaps you, like me, feel like we've entered an unusual time in life. Perhaps you feel like we don't interact with each other the way we used to. <laughs> you may not use the word crisis to describe it, but certainly, in my vernacular, it's a crisis. But maybe you just feel like in the pit of your stomach, people don't engage with each other the way they used to. Things are different. And in fact, it turns out they really are. Let me put this into context for you. Nielsen says that in the last 30 days, four-fifths of the United States, four-fifths of the population in the United States, watch television with the second or third screen open. Now, I'm not that old, you've heard. I'm not that old, but it wasn't that long ago that we used TV as the distraction. And now we need a distraction from the distraction, just to feel like we're not going insane. I mean, how long is a TV program? 22 minutes. You can't spend 22 minutes not looking at your phone, right? You're not alone. Now let me ask you this, if you're a television broadcaster, which of those two things is actually the activity in focus? Is television the activity when someone's sitting down with their face in Facebook? Or is Facebook the activity and TV's playing in the background? It's hard to tell. Now, I'll tell you that it actually amounts to an astounding amount of time. In fact, the average American will spend 75 minutes of their day today, nose down in their phone doing this. No, 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 no. 75 minutes. Oh my god, you guys. This device is eight years old. We've only had this device for eight years. And in eight years, the smartphone has eaten up 8% of our waking time, 1% a year, every year is going here. Where does that time come from? We're not sleeping less, by the way. That is a, is a good conclusion for you to draw. We're not sleeping less, it turns out. That time is being eaten up by this device from a whole range of other activities that people could or should be doing. Now, many people think that that's funny. They think it's cute. They're like, oh, what's the big deal, Gabe? What's the big deal? Things are changing. We're using our smartphones. Well. It is kind of a big deal, especially in business. And I'll tell you, not that long ago, I was approached by a big automaker, a really big automaker, one of the world's largest. And they said, Gabe, we have a problem. And I was like, cool, I love problems. What's your problem? And they said, American teenagers don't want to drive anymore. And I was like, what? I was like, really, I was thinking back, like, what? The year is 1990, OK? I turned 16. What did I do on the day that I turned 16? I went down to the driver's office to get my driver's license the day I turned 16. Of course, I didn't actually get it for about 30 days because I failed the first time, but it's not that important. Um, right? It was hard. It was harder than I thought. I was kind of cocky. Okay. 
You could not have pried the car wheel out of my hands in my teenage years. You couldn't have stopped me from driving if you'd wanted to. What is going on? How is this even possible? And they said, oh, well, we've done all this research. And the research tells us, you know, what you know, the millennial generation doesn't want to hurt the environment, right? So they don't like cars because cars are bad for the environment. And, oh, they don't like to spend money. They want to, the sharing economy, da, da, da. So they don't want to own a car. They don't want to drive a car because of the sharing economy. But the main reason, the main reason why American teenagers don't want to drive anymore is because they have heard the invective against texting and driving, and they're choosing not to drive. Let that sink in for a second. Talk about unintended consequences, right? They don't want to drive because they cannot also, and it's not texting, incidentally, it's Instagram, really, that was implicated in that, but still the same idea. If you'd come to me five years ago and said, Instagram would have killed the car, I would have said, you're insane, right? You would laugh me out of the room if I said that to you. But what does this lesson tell you? Let me tell you what it tells you. Very clear. People of this generation, the millennial generation, and even older people, we're going to talk about it, will follow their bliss wherever it takes them. They will follow, they will spend their time on the things that give them the most amount of positive reinforcement. And the truth is, and this is very important for all of you who are responsible for communication strategy, every single behavior is up for negotiation. Everything's on the table. It doesn't matter how many generations these kids, four parents and four parents and four, four, four parents, drove cars. It doesn't matter. Who gives a shit? Bye. The car's over. See ya. Sorry, not sorry. Okay? This is sorry, not sorry. Very quickly sums up the idea of what you're up against. Nothing is a given. Everything's in transition. And at the core of that is the power of games, I'd posit. It's games. It's games that these kids are playing. Three generations of gamers are playing. They're changing their brains. They're changing the way that we interact with the world around us. Now, I mentioned Instagram before a very good example of an app that's changed behavior, that's undoing the car. Now, you'd rightfully say, Gabe, Instagram is not a game. And I agree with you, Instagram is not a game. But it's kind of game-like, right? This scoreboard might remind you of a game. Or for example, Mint.com, a popular personal finance application in the United States, use game concepts to change people's behavior. Foursquare, which many of you know, announcing a big change in the way the app works this past week, when it debuted, a kind of game-like experience that got millions of people to do stuff that doesn't make any sense at all uh, for a long period of time using games. Or something that even more perhaps powerful and redemptive that many of you might be familiar with, Nike Plus. You guys know Nike Plus? A hardware-software combination in your shoe, on your body. It uploads your progress. It tells you how you're doing. Okay, today in the United States, 16 million people will run using Nike Plus. Do you know how big of a number that is? Do you know how fat Americans are? That is a huge number of people. It's a huge number of people. It's actually one third of all the people who run in the United States will run with Nike Plus. But let me dial you back for one second. In the mid 2000s, when Nike first had the idea of doing something cool with mobile technology associated with running, Nike was not the dominant brand in running. Any of you run? Were you wearing Nikes in the mid 2000s? No, right? You were wearing New Balance, you were wearing Asics. Nike was a hardcore running brand that had at that point become a fashion brand. And the running industry just kind of passed Nike by. And they said, is there a way we can recapture that energy? Can we reconnect with these people? And they saw the power of mobile and said, let's make this thing called Nike Plus. This transformation is so tremendous. The brand, to those people, the 16 million people who run with Nike Plus, the brand is actually doing something that's kind of like a Mad Men vision. It's Instead of just telling people that if you use our products, we will make you a better person, it's actually helping them do it. It's not just saying do it, it's your little buddy helping you along the way. And so for those people, Nike has transitioned from a company in the business of selling clothes and shoes to a wish fulfillment company, to a personal best company not just talking about it, helping you do it, and inserting itself into the brand discussion with its consumers in a place that's so intimate that very few brands get to be there. Nike is there when you set your goals and ambitions and dreams with your friends. They are the platform on which you do that, and then they help you along the way get to where you want to go. It is the power of a concept called gamification that enables that to occur. It is a complete 180 in the way that these, uh, that these businesses interact with their 
customers. And set against this kind of engagement crisis, it's also the techniques you need to understand to level the playing field, you see. You need to have these things in your arsenal so that you can make the things that you do, to make the things that your clients do, as engaging and interesting as all the other options that the consumer has on this device that they're spending 75 minutes a day playing. And you can too. So gamification is the concept of using the best ideas from games, loyalty programs, and behavioral economics to engage audiences and ultimately solve problems. And engagement is really the thing that we're after, you guys, because we can't do anything unless we have the engagement of our users. That is the precursor. If you're not paying attention to this thing, I can't get you to do anything after that. I can't change your mind. I can't change your opinion. I have to get you to focus. So, it's important to recognize a few things about what gamification is and isn't, though, in this definition. And then I'm going to show you some examples and give you some uh, design ideas that you can take away. The first thing is that gamification is a process, not a product. And what that means is we never, like, fully arrive at gamification nirvana, okay? We're constantly in a process of making things more game-like and more fun and more interesting because no game is fun forever, okay? It's important. Constantly doing it. Number two... Gamification is not just about throwing some crappy badges up on your shitty website, okay? <laughs> it's very common. You, this is probably the example that you think of right away. When I, when I say gamification, you probably think badges, okay? Badges are awesome. Badges are really meaningful. If you happen to know someone who's been in the military, or you or someone you know has been in scouting, you will know that badges are important and meaningful to those people, right? Those things they get, those things are important to them. But let me let you in on a little secret about badging, and it's a little bit meta. Badges are a very powerful technique, but they're only as meaningful as the people who receive them agree their meaningfulness is. Okay? If we don't collectively agree that these badges are important and meaningful, they don't mean anything. I'm not in, I'm, I don't have no connection to the military in either Canada or the United States. I don't know what those insignia are. You go collect all the insignia you want. That's important to you, but not to me. So meaningfulness is at the heart of a badging system that works. And so meaning is core and important. <laughs> and the last thing, and this is a really tough lesson, especially in a room of marketers, and I just want to lay this out for you. Uh, marketing is my profession at its core. Um, one of the things that gamification is not is it's not about making everything into a game. Okay? Now, this is tough. I'm sure many of you in the room have been involved at one time or another in your lives on a, on a gamification, a game-like marketing project of one kind or another, a communication project, right? But listen, you guys, we can't solve every problem just by making it a new game or putting a bird on it or pickling it, okay? It doesn't work like that. No, a few Portlandia fans in the room. Okay, it doesn't work like that. I, a week doesn't go by. I don't get some call from some crazy person, usually a CMO. I don't get some call from some person saying, oh my God, Gabe, I love it. Candy Crush is amazing. Let's make Candy Crush for my ice cream parlors. Or let's make an Angry Birds for my muffler repair company, which are a true request that I have received. Or let's do this thing in 30 days, right? This isn't what this is. This is not what this is about. We are not going to get where we want to go by making everything into a game, by having you go out and slay the wizard and like find the princess and kill the dragon, okay? The people peddling that stuff are crazy people. This is not what I want you to do. If your first instinct for any of the things that I'm talking about is to go and make a game out of it, I want you to stand down. I want you to take a big deep breath and I want you to take a step back. What I want you to do is I want you to fully embrace this idea that what we're going to do is we're going to take the best ideas from games and apply them to our unique and special needs. We're going to apply what makes games powerful and motivational to whatever it is that we need to do. Not necessarily make that thing into a game. And I'm going to show you some examples. So just briefly, by way of introduction, I'm Gabe Zickerman, which many of you know. Um, I've written three books on the subject of gamification. My latest is called The Gamification Revolution. It's a strategy book. It's, it's cool. Um, I edit the main kind of resource site on the subject, which is gamification.co. Feel free to check it out. I run a strategic consultancy and design consultancy called Dopamine. We help all kinds of companies do all kinds of cool stuff. We build great tools like this thing called LiveCube, which is a live event gamification uh, tool that um, you know, helps live events really get people kind of engaged on social media. And then I run this conference called G Summit, which is happening in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. And, and you know, would love to see you all there. But if you can't make it, uh, I put this URL on the board for you because many of the examples that I'm going to show you 
the people who created them have spoken at G-Summit, and you can go there and watch the videos of their work, okay? So if you're interested in getting deeper understanding of how some of these examples actually work and what people can do, you can check that out, gsummit.com, gamification.co. And one of the things that you can do is become certified in gamification design. There's the option to actually go through a series of certification steps. Okay, so why are games so powerful, you guys? Why are they powerful? Why do they work? What makes them work? I love science. Science is important. Okay, why? It turns out that humans have this core thing which is called intrinsic reinforcement. And here's how intrinsic reinforcement works. Anytime you challenge your something, yourself to something, big or small, doesn't matter, and then you achieve that thing, your brain secretes a little bit of this magical neurotransmitter called dopamine, okay? So the loop looks something like this. Challenge, achievement, oh, pleasure. Because dopamine is a pleasurable motivational chemical. Challenge, achievement, oh. And the next thing that happens in your brain is your brain says, please, ma'am, may I have another? And you go again. Now, here's the problem with intrinsic reinforcement, which is really core to the human experience. How often do you get this in your real life? How often do you get this dopamine jolt in your real life? How many times does your boss come to you and say, great job, like once a year? Uh, how many times can you beat your personal best in a marathon or watch your kids graduate from school? See the company you work for or represent listed in the stock market. It's pretty rare. But in the game world, this thing happens hundreds of times per hour. Because this is how games are designed. They're designed to just do this to you over and over and over again. Challenge achievement, ah, challenge achievement, ah. Sometimes it's challenge, ooh, this was really hard. Ooh, this is really hard. Try again, try again, try again. Any of you Angry Birds players, level 27? Okay, just try it again and again and again and again until you finally get through it, right? But the point is, the system is designed to make you go challenge achievement, pleasure, and do it again. And so people who grow up playing games or using game-like experiences, what that means is that over time by doing this, it rewires your brain. Dopamine's a powerful chemical. And in the end, it leaves you maybe feeling like the real world, this world, just a little boring, just a little gray compared to the reinforcement you can get in that world. Remember the Instagram car driving example. So while we're on the subject of cars, Let's look at some examples of gamification that, uh, that are powerful and motivational. I've talked about this one before. For some of you will know it, and for some of you it's new. Um, you all know speed cameras, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I was about to make a Canadian nanny state joke, but um, suffice it to say, uh, you can't get a medium rare burger. Um, so, okay, so the way speed cameras work in most of the parts of the country, most of the parts of the world, uh, take your picture, you're driving by, takes your picture, haha, they get your face, they get your license plate. You're screwed. Okay, in Scandinavia, in Sweden, the ticket that you get is not based on how fast you're going at the point of control, it's based on how much money you make. So Sweden has actually given out a $150,000 speeding ticket, a single ticket, which I'm sure was like to a band member of ABBA or uh, <laughs> someone like that. Other famous Swedes, Nina Cherry, uh, Bjorn Borg. I'm pretty good at this, you guys. Um, if we're ever doing like Swedish Trivial Pursuit, you should totally have me on your team. Okay. So, set against this backdrop, a guy named Kevin Richardson is asked to reimagine the speeding camera, game designer, game designer from the Bay Area. Here's what he comes up with. The way speed camera lottery works is instead of, and you drive by the speeding camera, it takes your picture, you get a ticket. Anyone who drives by the speed camera at or below the speed limit is automatically entered into a lottery to split the proceeds of the people who speed. Cool, right? Cool. We all agree, that's so cool. Okay, let me tell you how cool. Let me tell you how cool. The speed camera, the one that you see here, which is just installed on a street corner in Stockholm, lowered average speeds by 20% at the point of control, right? You said, I bet. Okay, great. So you guys, it's a rhetorical question. If we wanna change people's behavior, if we wanna change their affect, if we wanna change their perception, which one of these two methods do you think works better? A, we trust you. You know the right thing to do. You're a good citizen, you're a good employee. You're a good customer, you're a good member of society, you know what you're supposed to do, you know the right thing, you know, but we're gonna watch, and if we catch you, oh, you're gonna be sorry. Or, slow, drip-wise, positive social reinforcement for a job well done every time you do it, each and every time, and a punishment if you don't comply. Obviously B, right? I wouldn't put this up on the board if it wasn't B. And you knew it was B. You called it out because you've got kids or you've got dogs or something, right? Anybody who's ever had to train 
a young, impressionable mind will know that you cannot give people reinforcement days, hours, weeks, months after the event and expect them to figure out what they did wrong, right? And we also know that positive reinforcement is better than negative reinforcement, but positive reinforcement is more costly. But I posit, and you'll see, we have the technology to make this happen. And so reinforcement is one of the three Fs. It, feedback is the other way to think about it. Feedback, friends, and fun. And these are the three things that we need to make experiences engaging. The more we give people feedback, friends, and fun, the three Fs, the more we give them this, the more engaged they will be. Feedback, how are you doing? How are you progressing? What are you achieving? Friends, your social graph or your work colleagues or whatever. And fun is a little bit more squirrely, a little bit harder to pin down, different for different people. And so I want you to, as we go through some of these examples, I want you to parse, is this thing fun? Why is this thing fun? How are the three Fs embodied in some of these examples I'm going to share with you? So my first one, which is especially relevant to communications professionals, comes from Domino's. You guys all know Domino's. Perhaps, like me, you never eat there. Apologies if you work for Domino's. Um, they make pizza. They deliver pizza. So Domino's made this app called Domino's Pizza Hero. It's an iOS app. And with Domino's Pizza Hero, you play the role of a pizza yolo or a pizza yola, someone who makes pizzas. And the game starts you out. You're kneading the dough. You get in the dough. You're kneading the dough. And you're flipping the dough up like Luigi. And you're like, hey. And it's like, hey. And then you put it down. And you put the sauce on it and the vegetables and the cheese. And once you do well enough, you flick your finger. And it's baked at your local Domino's and delivered right to your house from inside the game. Domino's generates an incremental $1 million a week in revenue from this game. And if you're exceptionally good at it, they'll even invite you to apply for a job right from inside the game. OK? It's funny, right? It's funny. But Domino's has to actually legitimately replace 30,000 employees a year in the United States. They have a big attrition rate. It's a frontline uh, customer service job. This is a real thing. Now, this is an amazing example of the synergy of ideas, of marketing, of HR, of a company coming together. But what does this replace communications professionals? What's the important lesson for you here? You know what this replaces? This replaces that bullshit video that's up on Domino's website. Domino's Pizza was founded by Joe Domino in 1872. And then shot of multi-ethnic, very clean looking person in press Domino's uniform in a store. Domino's uses only the finest, freshest ingredients, locally sourced and harvested. Every pizza is handmade by a pizza craftsman. Okay. Soaring music, cue the music, Domino's is amazing. You know what? Nobody gives a shit about that. Nobody watches that stuff because nobody believes you. Nobody believes you. It's not that you're not believable. It's not that we don't love you, but this millennial generation doesn't believe you. And if you're the one putting that out under the brand of this company, they do not believe you. They won't believe you until one of their friends clicks like on the video and shares it and doesn't do that negatively, that's when they believe you. And more importantly, this generation doesn't want you to tell them what they should think. They want to do it. Instead of telling them what the experience is like making a pizza at Domino's, Domino's correctly figured out that what the player wants to do, what the consumer wants to do now, is feel it, experience it, make it visceral, put it on a path of progression and mastery, get feedback about it. So you feel good about it on so many levels. This is a way more positive experience than any other way we could communicate the values of the organization and the values of what it takes to be a good employee in the organization and the front line and what the product is about. You get to really shape and mold it in a unique and interesting way. Or take the example from that cultural message of Tabasco. So Tabasco's marketing team thought, here's an interesting idea. People who like spicy food are a tribe. This is the core conceit of this. People who like spicy food are a tribe, right? Let's explore that idea. And so they created a Facebook application called Tabasco Nation. And in Tabasco Nation, you earn points every time you drop a little bit of Tabasco sauce. You earn one point for every drop of Tabasco sauce that you use. And here's a little secret. They don't care if you cheat, because it doesn't matter. Because the game is designed in such a way that go ahead, cheat. We don't care. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point isn't validating that people correctly use the points. The point is creating the right kind of ideas about the brand and the right connections between fans of the brand. So challenges in Tabasco Nation were like, put Tabasco on your hot sauce. Take a jar of Tabasco up to the Eiffel Tower, OK? And then you earn like crazy, insane amounts of points and interact with other people and redeem them for cool experiences that, that Tabasco would gladly give to you anyway. The idea is 
to engage people in a kind of visceral social experience in which they're able to experience the brand in new ways and express themselves in new ways. This doubled in six months the total social media footprint of Tabasco in six months across all channels, very powerful. An idea that you've probably heard of if you've read Dan Pink's book Drive, certainly, is this idea called autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And autonomy, mastery, and purpose feel, uh, features heavily in many of the best gamification examples because they're part of what makes this feedback loop actually meaningful, and we talked about meaningfulness. And so I want to give you the example of Delta Airlines and their application called Ready, Set, Jet. Now, this faces employees at Delta, and I'm sure that many of you also have considerations about millennial employees, so I'm going to touch on some examples that face a gamer generation from that perspective, but the, the principles apply equally well to consumers. So, Delta a few years ago uh, decided to onshore its customer service team from the Philippines and India where it had been outsourced. So they set about hiring thousands of American-based agents to answer the phones for Delta. And then they found an interesting kind of challenge, which is that Americans are not particularly good at geography, and geography is an important thing to know if you work at the front line at an airline. Um, so, because many of you know, uh, you have to know whether it's Athens, Georgia, or Athens, Greece, if you're booking a ticket for somebody. Um, so Delta was faced with this challenge of, we've hired all these great American people, we're bringing them back into the, into the fold, we've got to teach them geography and all the other things that it takes to be a Delta employee, and how to give great service, and how to engage them, and so they said, let's make that thing fun, let's make sure there's lots of feedback, and let's make it social, and they built this thing called Ready, Set, Jet, and let me tell you, in the first year of Ready, Set, Jet at Delta Airlines, Delta employees did four years worth of training in one year. They did as much training as they would normally do in four years in one year, and the kicker is Ready, Set, Jet could only be played optionally in your spare time. The game was not available to you during working hours. It was locked out during working hours. So they did it optionally. What? When was the last time you did optional employee training? Right? Most employee training is like, ur, 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 get me through this as quickly as I can. Yes, I'm not going to sexually harass anyone. Uh-huh, gotcha. I promise not to steal any data. Cool, right? What's at the core of this? The core of this is Delta setting out and saying, we want the thing that we make to be something you would want to do in your spare time. That's what it takes. That's all it takes. The organization just has to say, let's make people want to do this. And then naturally, the gamification elements will fall in line behind that principle. And at its core, and this is very important, is Delta acknowledging the way that people spend their time today isn't the way we think. We used to think that people divided their time into these discrete buckets, right? This is work time. This is play time. This is church time. This is family time. That's not how people are. There are two buckets of time for people. Optional time and required time. And let me tell you how small required time is. What's really required for you to do in your day? Like, get up and go to the bathroom, probably. And everything else is in optional time. And everything else is competing against everything else on a kind of level playing field for people's attention. Right? Hence the, I'm sure none of this, this doesn't apply to any of you, I'm sure none of you touch your smartphones once you're in the office at nine o'clock, because as good employees, of course, you're focused only on work from nine to five. Never do anything else. Nobody does anything else, right? So productivity and engagement are key and part of that equation. But also, we need to teach. And companies like Autodesk have come to understand the importance of teaching as a part of what they do. So they make 3D modeling software, some of you might know. It's complicated software, and every time a big 3D movie comes out, Everyone goes and downloads the free trial of Autodesk software from the internet, because they're like, I want to do 3D movies. And then they find out it's actually kind of hard to do 3D modeling, and so they stop using the app. And Autodesk said, hmm, here's the thing. If we want more people to buy our software, maybe we need to at least get them onboarded to the idea of doing 3D modeling, meaning we need to teach them a little bit to get them to do what we want them to do if we ultimately want them to do software. So they built this thing that's layered on top of their 3D modeling software. They borrowed a page from Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. Some of you might remember that game. If you're, uh, uh, certainly if you're my age, you remember that game. And so they borrowed a page from Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, and they layered a series of challenges on top of the app. So you download the app, and the first thing is it's like, you're a secret agent. There's been a challenge. You've got to unlock this clue. And in order to unlock the clue, you make a 3D object. 
They're like, yay, let's go to Barcelona. And you go to Barcelona and they give you another clue. In order to unlock that, you've got to rotate the object. And then you've got to bounce the object. And then you've got to put it in water. And then you've got to set it on fire. And then you've got to knock it against the wall. And oh my God, the next thing you know, you're 3D modeling in the game. This idea, this really simple idea of putting people on a quest to improve their personal skills raised the total amount of time that people used that app by Autodesk by 40% and increased total revenue by 17%. Just this. Just this little idea of let's get people to keep using the app, let's get people to learn a little bit how our thing actually works. And I'll tell you what, here's the kicker. A seat of this software costs $3,500. We are not talking about getting people increasing 17% revenue on a 99 cent sale of product. This is a real hard thing to sell to people to get them to convert on, and that's the idea. But ultimately, sometimes the examples that we do, especially in gamification, as we talked about kind of feedback, friends, and fun, sometimes the examples that we do are maybe a little bit more fun and maybe they're a little bit more um, carefree than some of the other examples that we've talked about. And one of my favorites for this uh, comes from the Sochi Olympics and the Sochi squat machine. Some of you may have seen this. So Visa and the, uh, and the Olympic Organizing Committee in Russia, recognizing that the Russian population also has a kind of looming, mega looming health crisis, as part of promotion for the Sochi Games, put these machines in a few Moscow subway stations. And this machine is a standard Moscow ticket vending machine, except it has kind of like uh, Xbox Connect technology in it from Microsoft. And basically what you do is if you do 30 squats, in front of the machine, you get a free ticket, okay? You just walk up to the machine, do 30 squats, just like an Olympian would do, and it shows you your progress on the screen. Yay, you're doing it, and you get a free ticket. Now, when I talked about this example in a workshop I was doing in the Netherlands, some dude was immediately like, yes, that's not practical. And I was like, yeah, you're right, okay, you're right. Moscow has a population of about 25 million people. It's the largest city in Europe. Um, it would be impractical to change all of the ticket vending machines in Moscow, let alone in, in even more calm and relaxed Ottawa, um, it, would be, it would be a real challenge to change all vending machines to this approach. We're not gonna tear out all the vending machines and use this approach. But what this approach does is highlights very clearly how a little bit of fun can drive a lot of attention to an idea and a lot of engagement from people in a new and interesting way. This was a very, very successful story for the Sochi uh, for the Sochi Olympics overall, um, certainly against the context of uh, um, weird toilets and uh, hidden cameras. So before we, before we kind of wrap up, I do want to share with you one more kind of idea from the design side of gamification, give you as food for thought as communication professionals about how we interact with this gamer generation with the millennials. And we call this model SAPS, and it stands for Status, Access, Power, and Stuff. And this is the list of rewards that consumers want or employees want for good behavior for you, from you. For doing what you've asked them to do, they want you to give them status, access, power, and stuff in order of stickiest to least sticky, most meaningful to least meaningful, and also conveniently for you, cheapest to most expensive. Now, if you dial back to your Psych 101 days, this might remind you a little bit of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's a somewhat abstraction of that, recognizing that most of our consumers and employees are really playing in the top part of the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy now, right? But status is giving somebody something that allows them to feel better about themselves than the people around them without having to act like a dick. Access is, it's true, that, right? The badge, the badge means I don't have to walk up to you and go, I'm better than you. The badge tells you I'm better than you without me having to do that, right? That's important, it's important. If a badge falls in a forest, okay. Access, <laughs> access is about giving people the ability to access something that they typically cannot get for money. So something really special, like early time in a store or on a sale or time with the president of the company or the prime minister of the country, something that you can buy. Power is when you give people control over others in the world, real or virtual. So you decide who does what and when, who goes on vacation when and what happens and so on. And stuff is free things, discounts, coupons, giveaways, cash, okay? Now, we all agree, all of you are not, I see many of you nodding, and you're like, you all agree, right, that cash is not 
a strong enough motivator. Stuff is not a strong enough motivator to get people to do their personal best, to really get where we need to go. We know it's kind of not that good, but collectively, certainly in the marketing industry, we kind of ignore this and keep, you know, as soon as something goes wrong, it's all about a sale and it's all about getting, you know, giving people stuff. And we have a new product. You know what we should do? Let's give it away. Street teams. Yeah. Put the product in people's hands. Now, let me explain to you, though, the mechani mechanics of why you don't want to use cash and why you don't want to use stuff and why you don't want to use free things. And it's important because it's based on a core psychological concept called habituation. Habituation. And here's how habituation works, okay? Your brain through evolution is hardwired to take a stimulus and tamp down its impact very quickly to habituate you to that stimulus. So, so for example, in this room, you probably stop noticing that there's a hum from the electronics and from the speakers, that it's a little bit cold probably, uh, that there's, a bright, there's bright lights around you, uh, that your neighbor smells a little bit, um, right? All of those things have faded because of habituation. Because imagine if that didn't work. Imagine if that wasn't a thing. What would it be like being a person? You'd be like, oh my God, it's bright. Oh geez, it's bright. Wow, it's really bright. I can't deal with how bright it is, right? It would be crazy. It would be crazy. So your brain has to naturally kind of tamp that down and turn the volume down so that you can focus on the important stuff. But habituation also has a dark side. Habituation has a, a dark side. A um, couple years ago, research um, comes out, published in New York Times. This researcher, I think at Penn, was looking at couples. She researched 20,000 couples and realized that around the two-year mark, and I'm not talking about any of you because none of you, this is not your experience, but around the two-year mark, the average relationship shifts from romantic affection to companionship affection. And the researcher was out to prove that this was normal, that couples don't need to feel like they're failing at around the two-year mark, right? So for the first couple of years, you wake up and you're like, oh, yeah, right? You are awesome. And then, like, after a couple of years, you're like, we woke up. Um, so there's a real shift. Not you, not your relationships. Your relationships are awesome. Okay. No, so the, so the researcher's purpose, her goal, was to make that normal and say that's normal and you shouldn't feel like a failure and don't feel like a failure. So let me, let me ask you this, communications professionals. Let me ask you this. If, for the average person, sex with the hottest person you can get to reliably sleep with you has two years of lifespan for the average person before the novelty wears off, how hard do you have to work to get and keep people's attention over the long haul at a company? It's, I'm only slightly joking. <laughs> Let me put it to you differently. Let me put it in a different context, and maybe, maybe it will resonate differently for you. Um, remember your first paycheck? Take a second. First time you got paid? Think about it, OK? Depending on how old you are uh, and what you did. Some of you remember you got an actual physical check. There was a time the Canadians used physical checks. Um, you may have received a physical check. You may have received a giant novelty check. Um, <laughs> depending on what you were doing. Very exciting stuff. You have to talk to me about it if you did. Um, you might, might have received a, a bank draft, a, a direct transfer into your account, uh, or a wad of cash if you worked in the black market, right? So all these things. And so think, think back. Think back to your first paycheck, OK? What did you do when you got your first paycheck? You were like, yeah, I'm rich. Oh, mm. And you like took someone out. You took your mom out if you're a good person. You took your mom out for a dinner or drinks, or you took your like boyfriend or girlfriend out for drinks, or you like you were like yes, you like bought a two four and you like just drank it by yourself in the park. I don't know what you did, but you got really excited about it. Now, what about your last paycheck? What about your last paycheck? It was probably a lot bigger for most of you. For some of you, it was hundreds of times larger than that first paycheck. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Where was your enthusiasm? Where was your excitement? Why didn't you respond that way? I'll tell you what would have gotten your attention if it hadn't come in, right? Then we would have gotten your attention to that paycheck. Then you would have been like, something has happened. I must respond. You see how people are? They very quickly price in a reward, very quickly. We are novelty-seeking animals. And when we are given a reward, we price it in real fast. We very quickly take that reward and say, well, that's expected now. And so I'm going to need a bigger reward from you in order to get excited. I'm going to need a bigger story to run that story. I'm going to need a bigger sale to get excited to come into your store. 
I'm going to need more for you to keep getting my attention. So if you have to scale up your reward system, which you have to do for every kind of reward you give someone, status, access, and power are non-cash, non-tangible rewards, which can be scaled up at minimal incremental cost to the organization. Stuff, however, just costs more and more and more money. And at some point, you reach a point of indifference with the consumer, where you can no longer motivate them with cash. Right? So this is the key. And remember, there's very, very few video games that you've seen that pay out to their users in cash. Very few people are sitting in front of their Xboxes, or if you're like my mom, in front of Candy Crush, and we're going to talk about her in one second. Very few people are sitting in front of their Xboxes waiting for the tickets to come out that give them money. Because they don't need to. You don't need to compensate game players with cash and stuff in the real world in order to get them to play. What you need to do is design with feedback, friends, and fun. And so we've been talking a lot here about the concept of the millennials. I think we mostly have been focused on the concept of the millennials. And so one of the obvious questions that might come up for you is, OK, Gabe, that's cool, great, but I don't happen to work in an environment that's all millennials. Not all the consumers are young. They're not all gamers. What about older people? OK, nothing that I have said to you today, none of the ideas that I've presented, none of the concepts that I've presented to you have been exclusively for young people. I'm using them as a reference point because they're different, but none of them are about young people. In fact, remember I was talking about my mom a second ago? My mom, I can almost guarantee you, I, sometimes I actually want to do this from the stage. I want to call her and put her on speaker so you, can, so you can just be with me on a normal day when I call my mom. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, Candy Crush. OK? <laughs> because my mom is part of actually the biggest gamer demographic in the world, women over 45 who collectively play more games than any other group of people on Earth. You know that. Some of you know that. The difference between that generation and the 15-year-olds and the 20-year-olds and the millennial generation is somewhat semantic. Because the difference is my mom, if you said, are you a gamer, she would never say yes to that question. She doesn't know how to say yes to that question. She's not a gamer. No, of course not. Candy Crush is not a, I'm not a gamer, right? I just like Candy Crush. That's different, right? And the other difference, and let me tell you the other difference, and this is an important difference, because I, all day today, I think I've sounded like such an old dude. I've been up here being like, you get off my lawn, you crazy kids. OK, so, <laughs> so, so, so let me reset this for you for one second. And let me tell you, every generation, some old dude gets up and says to you, this new generation sucks, and they're, they're doing things differently, and everything's going to be different, and the whole world's going to turn upside down. OK, I know I sound like that dude, but let me tell you what's different about the previous conversations that we've had about new technologies and new disruptions and the world changing and the difference with the millennial generation. Because let me tell you how the millennial generation is different and why this is very important, why this is so urgent for you. The difference between the millennial generation and, let's say, my generation is that unlike the people who came before them, if the millennials don't get what they want, they just start a competitor. They don't stick around. They don't wait for you to give them what they want. They're not patient enough to see through, to wait for you to deliver the rewards that they're looking for, to give them the positive reinforcement that they need, to help connect them to society, to their products and services, their government, whatever. They're not going to wait around. They just leave, and they start something new. And so this generation, empowered with technology and entrepreneurship, really represents a sea change for us. And it's important that at this moment we take those ideas and actually apply them uh, using the principles of gamification. And um, I, I want to say to you that my Twitter handle is up on the board. It's actually, you're missing the M. It's at G-Z-I-C-H-E-R-M or G-Z-I-C-H-E-R-M. I had to translate that into Canadian. Um, for you, I really, really, really hope that from today forward we get to be BFFs. Okay, you guys? And so if you want to be my BFF, you can be my BFF on your choice of social media platform. You can choose all of them. But totes be my BFF. If you do, you get to see all the pictures of all the food that I'm eating and all the things that I'm cooking, um, and all the hilarious signs that I photograph because it's really cool being my friend. But actually, the reason why I want you to be my friend is because I want you to come to me and talk to me about how these ideas are affecting you. If you've got a crazy concept, if you've got a concern, if there's something burning a hole in your brain or you want to just talk to somebody, 
Treat me as your gamification therapist, right? Come, hang out, tweet at me. Um, and let's talk about things. If you take the ideas that we talked about today, if you really internalize those and you see them, you see those examples, and you take feedback, friends, and fun, and the concepts of mastery, autonomy, and purpose, that you understand the dopamine loop is rewiring people's brains, that it's changing the way that the fluid intelligence of this next generation actually works, and you seek to add that concept, to add these ideas to the things that you do to create engagement with your audience, and that you know not to make everything into a game to actually make that happen, you can leverage the power of gamification to transform your communications and to powerfully, powerfully restructure how you interact with the world, with your consumers, with your employees, and have that positive change in engagement that you're looking for. Thank you.